Thanks so much, Jen. Thanks a lot for having us here tonight. Uh, as Jen said, my name is Corey, Corey McGee. This is my friend and colleague, Jason Boissano. And uh, we are your moderators for tonight. So uh, we'll be moderating our discussion on food insecurity. So Jason and I, a little bit about us. We are lifelong Timmins residents. And uh, since we've started families and uh, planted roots here in Northern Ontario, we've basically become more conscious of community issues. And uh, what do community conscious individuals do? Well, they start a podcast so that they can talk to interesting people in the community. And that's what me and Jason did. So if uh, anybody's wondering what organization we're part of, it's the, uh, well, there are children here, so it's not that appropriate for them. We're the Beer and Bull podcast. That uh, we, And what we do is uh, we talk to individuals in the region uh, we while enjoying some refreshments. So Jay will talk a little bit more about that and uh, what we've done in the past. And then we'll move on to uh, some opening remarks, I think. All right. I didn't know I was going to talk about what we've done in the past. Uh, but yeah, so we are just uh, two, quote unquote, uh, podcasters. And uh, we've sp spoken about many different issues in Timmins, uh, essentially trying to keep, uh, you know, uh, skilled and uh, educated individuals and, and young people in the, in the community and also just uh, new businesses, new entrepreneurs in the area and uh, local politicians. We've had you know, former council members, current council members. We've had uh, members of parliament, mem members of Queen Park. So we have uh, we like to discuss a lot of different issues. So uh, that's really the only thing uh, else I would have added on to Corey's great introduction. So I guess we will uh, somewhat get started on uh, what we're doing today. So first, I want to say thanks... Uh, for the meal, I want to thank uh, thanks. To, I want to give a thanks to uh, Michael, uh, uh, Chef Michael York, uh, for coming up with a fabulous meal tonight. It was awesome. I know I enjoyed it. <laughs> also, we'd like to thank the members of the uh, Timmins Canets and other uh, local uh, volunteers who helped us uh, serve the food and uh, dish everything out. So, thank you very much. We would like to also say thank you to some of the local farms, uh, Graham Acres and Borealis Fresh Farms, for helping supply some of the food that was uh, provided for the meals. <laughs> and also some of the local businesses like uh, Dabrowski's, Tough Nettles Fresh Pasta, Golden Crest Special Bakery, for their sponsorship, and to uh, Starbucks for uh, providing coffee for tonight's evening. And finally, a thank you to uh, Lord's Kitchen Society for sharing their, lo uh, their location with us. Without them, this event uh, and their direct connections to the importance of local food for a force secure community would not be possible. So thank you very much. So before uh, Corey takes over and takes the mic away from me, I just want to do a, bit, uh, a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, washrooms, the location of washrooms are uh, on the left of the kitchen. Uh, there's men and women's washroom there, so feel free to uh, use as needed. Uh, we will be taking photos throughout the event. If anyone does not want to be in the photo or in any photos, just uh, just uh, maybe put your hand up uh, or put your hand up and there's uh, Brian Jones who uh, is taking photos at the event. If you would not like to be in any of the photos, just put your hand up and uh, uh, Brian will uh, make sure that uh, he doesn't take a photo of you. Uh, we encourage your participation, so please use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff, and use the hashtag EatThinkVote and tag us at Food Secure Canada or Food Secure Can. Sorry. Uh, also, there are extra uh, question cards on every table. If you do have a question, feel free to write something down. You can ask the question yourself, or you can have uh, Corey here uh, can ask the question for you. So feel, please feel free to write down a question, ask anything that might come up. Uh, hopefully revolving around food security, and we will uh, happily ask that question for you. Thank you very much. Okay, so before Jay moves on to introducing the candidates, which uh, is what everybody is here to, to hear the responses to this issue are, I'd like to talk a little bit about the issue at hand. So as a community, we see many, many effects of food insecurity in Timmins. We know that food is more expensive in the Porcupine Health Unit area compared to the provincial average. We also know that poor diets raise the risks of diseases like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Our Timmins James Bay riding is particularly affected by the issues of food insecurity. This is what we would like to talk to our candidates about today. So Jason's going to take, uh, take the lead here and introduce our candidates. All right, get into the middle there. You might want to turn your mic on before you head over there. There you go. 
So uh, while Corey actually videos. does his job, uh, we're, uh, I just want to say we're ecstatic to have uh, all uh, local pr- uh, representatives of all the parties here in Timmins today. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we have Mr. Charlie Angus from the NDP. We have Miss Michelle Boileau from the Liberal Party. Mr. Kramer Granke from the Conservative Party. Mr. Max Kennedy from the Green Party. And Mr. Renaud Roy from the PPC. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so how we're going to start this today, we're going to have opening remarks from every candidate. Uh, we're we're going to give them two minutes of opening remarks on food insecurity. And each candidate will have equal amount of time uh, to answer that. So essentially two minutes. And uh, then we will go into the question and answer uh, format of, the, of tonight's uh, discussion, I guess. So I guess we can... Uh, Pardon? Oh, we yes. have time. Actually, Corey, is that you? You're supposed to be talking about this? The, the format? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. I'm not staying on top of my this stuff is here. Bell. <laughs> We've had cards. Yeah, you did. Yeah. We'll blame Jen. All right. So for opening remarks, the ru- we'd like to provide the guidelines and the rules for uh, our candidates here. Essentially, we'd like to give you guys the opportunity to give your opening remarks on food insecurity. Each candidate will be given an equal amount of time to present, so that'll be two minutes, and then we can go into the Q&A. So following the Q&A period, each candidate will have two minutes for closing remarks as well, and we'll begin in alphabetical order uh, with Mr. Charlie Angus. Well, thank you. I'd like to first of all give thanks for the incredible food and for your presence here. I am very, very excited by this. It shows me the power of community in Timmins and how serious these issues are being taken. I want to thank Anti-Hunger Coalition who are doing incredible work. We are changing the conversation about food insecurity, but also food security. And this is what I want to speak to you tonight about. At a time when young people are walking out of classrooms around the world, when people are blocking bridges in our major cities because they want to see someone take action, in the face of catastrophic climate change. One of those solutions is community and food security is fundamental to that. The need to start to create local food opportunities here so we're not just shipping up beef from Mexico or avocados for wherever they come from. Creating sustainable food economies is really important. Tonight I'm going to talk about a number of the issues facing our region, certainly in the far north where we see people going hungry because of the horrific costs of food, the insecurity here in the Timmins region, but also the incredible opportunity that we're seeing if we put tools together to establish a coherent national food strategy, something that's very close to the heart of the New Democratic Party, something that I've been working on for a number of years. At the end of the day, my friends, it's about creating community as a solution, community that is empowering, not about charity, but about dignity. And that's something that we see in the work of the Lord's Kitchen and what's being done in Timmins. We're talking about together, we can be part of a much larger solution that is about making sustainable communities and the decisions we make will make huge differences in the years to come. Thank you very much, Miigwech. Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, Michelle? Thank you. Can we hear me okay? Should I bring this closer to you? Yeah. Probably closer to you, yeah. Okay, yeah? Is this, oh, it is on. Okay, hi. <laughs> Bonjour, Wache. It's a pleasure to be here among all of you tonight, and I'm so glad that we're gathered to discuss these really important issues for our region. As someone who has worked in education, I know that there are many students from kindergarten to post-secondary that are going to school hungry, and that's simply unacceptable. Under the Liberal government, we saw the introduction of the National Poverty Reduction Strategy, as well as the National Food Policy. We want to keep building on this progress and address food insecurities in all its forms. We know that there are high costs associated with accessing traditional Indigenous foods. We also know that healthy staples are too expensive in our region for our families and our seniors. That's why we need more programs like the ones that this government had created in collaboration with communities, like the Harvester Grant Program that makes traditional hunting more affordable in the North, or the National School Food Program that is being developed with the provinces and territories. We need solutions that empower our communities and our regions. 
because we also know the challenges that climate change, change sorry, brings to food security in the north with the impacts it has on our ecosystems. I remember speaking to my friend's grandpa, Ben Moussini, who was telling me about how the window for hunting geese has narrowed and has become a much less predictable. And so that's important. It's important to have a bold climate plan as well as to continue investing into our northern communities. It's also important to continue supporting our families and our seniors. The expanded Canada Child Benefit has lifted 16,000 children in our riding alone out of poverty and has helped parents afford healthier food for their children. Our re-elected government is going to increase this program by, uh, sorry, 15% for all children under the age of one. Old age security was also increased and improved under this government, and seniors over the age of 75 will, under a re-elected Liberal government, receive an average of $729 more every year. So supporting families and seniors works. When we invest in people, systematic challenges like food insecurities can be better addressed. So, uh, and that's why I'm inspired that this room is full tonight because this is an important issue to be discussing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Polo. Uh, Mr. Grinke. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much also to the Anti-Hunger Correlation and to uh, Chef Michael for the incredible food this evening. Like I said, my name is Kramer Granke. I'm very proud to say that I was born and raised here in Timmins. After spending some time away at university, I was, I was able to come back home and, and haven't been happier. Throughout this election, the cost of food has been an important topic and resonates throughout the platform of the Conservative Party. We know that the cost of living has been dra dramatically increasing in the last four years. Everyone in this room knows that when the cost of heating, transportation, and children's activities begin to rise, the food budget can and will suffer. Food, secure, food insecurity takes a toll on all of us. As a society, we know that it'll take a toll on our mental and our physical well-being. As a party, we want to create an environment where all people can get ahead, to ensure families that they have enough money in their monthly budget to eat properly and eat well. Food knowledge and understanding ultimately get, begins at a young age, and I'm very happy to see a young group of students here uh, volunteering this evening. That is something we believe needs to be introduced to ensure that our young generation has the nutrition and the tools used to understand the importance of food in their everyday lives. The Conservative strongly believes in supporting local farmers. I've had the opportunity to talk to dozens of farmers throughout this campaign period in the region. Those who operate a small patch of land just down the road to those down farther south in the riding who operate an operation of 11,000 acres. By ensuring that we can support those farmers and provide access to locally produced food, we can help address some of the supply issues in the region. Prices are an issue definitely throughout our region, even more as you move farther up the north in the riding. Prices at the northern store in the far north of our ridings is, someone, is something that even brought to me by a grade 5-6 class as I visited them at Moosini Public. A group of students who are 10 years old asked me what we can do to lower the prices so that family can allocate more money to food on a monthly budget. We're not going to solve these issues tonight, but I look forward to the ideas and thoughts of everyone who is here tonight to passionately articulate their thoughts for us to get ahead. Thank you, Mr. Granke. Mr. Kennedy. I also would like to uh, thank the Anti-Hunger Coalition and that uh, mixed meat bouillonnaise was fantastic. Um, food is obviously a huge part of the climate crisis that we all face and that's threatening future generations and we really need to act on it. It's difficult though to develop a coherent package of policies if you don't have a vision of what that future looks like. The Green Party has that vision. It's the elimination of poverty. Food security is not just about the availability of food. food. It's about the complex of living supports that impact your ability to access that food. These include poverty, which I've already mentioned, and we're going to address that with a guaranteed livable income, the elimination of student tuition, forgive the federal portion of student loans, affordable housing, building renovations so that your heating and uh, cooling costs are lowered, enhance public transit so that people can get from here to there and not break the bank. Increased CPP uh, for our elder, elderly, affordable, and universal child care for young families. All of the, these things act to take dollars out of your pocket that you can use for accessing good, healthy food. With respect to food itself, we'll support transitioning away from factory food to local food. 
local family farmed regenerative agriculture, local production for local consumption. We'll expand small scale farming supports, address food waste, which is a big issue. A lot of food gets thrown in the garbage and directly support school and breakfast and, and lunch programs. Food security is based on what we know and is achievable. With your support, we can do this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Roy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy that this event is taking place right here tonight at the Lord's Kitchen. I was born in Iroquois Falls and grew up on a farm. I am very familiar with what goes into agriculture and the production of eggs and meat such as beef, pork, and chicken. In 1995, I took a leave of absence from my job in Iroquois Falls and went to live in the former communist country of Romania where I founded a charitable, non-governmental organization called the Bridge of Hope. That was the beginning of what turned out to be 15 years of working among the poor, where at the time, people earned on average the equivalent of 150 Canadian dollars a month. I also worked among their gypsy population, which lived on even less than that. People in the country with little plots of land and even people in the city with backyards would maximize every space to cultivate vegetables and fruits. Many would also receive produce from their relatives in the country. During my entire time in Romania, I was able to do what I did, mainly through the generosity of Canadians ba here back at home. I discovered that when people believe in your vision and what you are doing, when you are open and transparent where, with where the funds go, donations do come in. People should not give under compulsion, but freely from their hearts. That is true generosity or Christian charity. Let me say this. I do not believe that government should be seen as provider, but rather as facilitator. Governments have no financial resources other than what it goes and takes by force, really, in your, in your pockets and mine, and from what it borrows. But then, even the deficits of today are the taxes of tomorrow. To put it simply, if I ask the government for financial assistance, it turns around and picks my neighbor's pocket and gives what I ask for. When a citizen pays taxes, he expects a service in return, and rightly so. But when a government takes your money by force of the law and gives it to someone else, that government no longer serves the best interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now I guess we'll get into uh, a couple of questions. I know Corey and I have some questions lined up, and we have a few uh, audience questions. Well, Corey, go ahead. Yeah, so as you arrive today, you were provided with the opportunity to write your questions down. Throughout the evening, we'll be, ask, uh, we'll be asking candidates some of those questions as well as questions from the floor. So if anybody wants to come up and uh, ask a question directly to, to the candidates, they can do that. Uh, we'd like to remind the audience that the questions shouldn't be directed to one party or to one specific candidate. They should be directed to the, to the entire panel, okay? Um, furthermore, please keep the questions and comments polite in nature. Any inappropriate comments and questions will not be tolerated, okay? I'm trying to keep this civil here today. <laughs> Uh, due to time constraints, there may not be an opportunity for everyone's questions to be asked, but we will do the best we can. All candidates will have one minute to answer each question, and, we'll be, and we will alternate in alphabetical order, which candidate answers every new question first. The timekeepers will indicate with a yellow card, just like they did for the, um, uh, the opening remarks, that uh, when you're at the 45-second mark, and then a red card when you're at the one-minute mark at which point we'll politely ask the candidates to wrap up their answers. So we ask that all candidates focus on themselves and their, party pla their party's platforms when answering the questions in order to keep the conversation productive. So does anybody have any questions about the process? Nope. No? Okay, so we'll start with a question from Jason uh, to get things going here. And uh, Mr. Charlie Angus, your, an your answer to that question. All right, so the first question... I agree. <laughs> The first question uh, will, will be, uh, more than 4 million Canadians are food insecure. If elected, what would you do to ensure that all Canadians can access healthy and culturally appropriate food? Well, I thank you very much for that question. Uh, the New Democratic Party have been pushing for a national food security strategy. Canada signed on in 1976 
uh, that everyone would have access to food and nothing's ever been done since. We are the one G8 country without that national security. Uh, food strategy. We will put that in place. So what does that mean? Well, certainly uh, in the far north, the male uh, food program has been a complete failure. We will fix that. We will start to put investments to make sure that we move away from urban uh, food deserts where people can actually even get half-decent quality food because the grocery stores have moved out of many areas that we will then uh, work to make sure that everyone, uh, in terms of their family income, are able to start seeing some relief. And some of that's going to come from ending the interest on student debt. Uh, some of that's going to come from starting to put a more credible plan in for pensions and security for families who have so little. Thank you, Ms. Rangas. Madame Boileau. Thank you. If we've learned anything in the last four years, is that this is a priority for the Liberal government. Um, it certainly is. We've put in place the National Food Policy, um, which umbrellas and covers a lot of this, as well as the National um, Poverty Reduction Strategy. And so, as mentioned in my opening, increases to the Canada Child Benefit to make sure that families have more money to choose healthier options for their children. That's one way we're going to address this. Again, our seniors are often living in poverty, and so by increasing old age security, by strengthening our Canada Pension Plan, we're going to make it easier for our seniors to make healthier food choices as well. We're going to continue building on the great work that was done in the last four years and, 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 and stay committed to the investments that we've made. And so we have invested, redirected $100 million into agri-food uh, innovation. And so uh, if we want to see you know, to further develops in agriculture here in the north, we're going to have to keep investing in that. Things like the Northern Isolated Community Initiative Fund to help our isolated communities buy freezers and build greenhouses, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Greinke. Thank you for the question. You know, I, I think this is exactly the fits into the Conservative platform of investing in ourselves to ensure that we have these availabilities in our region, that the costs stay, you know, relatively reasonable. We, we've seen that as costs have risen, as, you know, we live in, especially in our region, we understand that transportation costs are definitely a major thing here in the north, ensuring that transportation costs stay moderate or transportation is available to ensure that our grocery stores have prices uh, at a moderate level. Also, where I spoke in my opening statement about investing in farmers here in our region to ensure they can provide more locally grown food uh, at a reasonable price and that you know we can sustain our, our environment here in the north as well which become number one priority. So ultimately that it's food pro programs to ensure that you know we have the availability here in our region and ensuring that we can keep costs at a moderate level so that at month end you know you have enough money put aside to ensure that you have a healthy lifestyle in your household. All right, thank you Mr. Granke. Uh, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you. One of the major parts of our, the green platform is the transition to a new green economy. That green economy is said to uh, provide up to 2 million new jobs. If people are working, they have food security. As I mentioned in my opening, uh, we'll also be looking to eliminate poverty. Poverty is number one in making food insecure for everyone. With a guaranteed livable income, everybody will have access to good, nutritious food as opposed to a food substitute. By increasing CPP from 25% of your income when you're earning a living to 50%, we will also make food security a lot easier for old, uh, the elderly. For our pe uh, people in the far north, we're looking at programs where they can grow their own local food. Uh, things like containerized food and that development, that kind of thing will make their food accessible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Roy. I really love the community approach that ACT uh, uses. And since I mentioned that I believe government should be the servant of its people, it should do everything in its power, like I said before, to be a facilitator of the people's goodwill and resolutions. Here's what I will push for. That the federal government forms national teams of experts in relevant areas and have them dispatched at the request of communities like ours to come alongside organizations like yours to train, equip with the necessary tools of knowledge and become most efficient 
uh, in reaching their specific goals and better serving the community. Such teams could be made up of accountants and bookkeepers, communications and marketing specialists, fundraising experts, IT people, government liaison people, even tradespeople for setting up offices and shops. The purpose of these teams would be to teach people how to fish rather than depend constantly on tax dollars. Teams would be dispatched according to the size of the organization and the stage they have reached in their development. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McGee, would you like to ask a question? Yes, yeah, so along with questions from the audience, we did gather some questions before uh, the start of the event tonight. And this question comes from Lindsay Mullins Keone, uh, indigenous from the Indigenous Na Neighbors Programs and uh, Mennonite Central Committee. Mm -hmm. She writes, I recall shopping for fresh produce at the Northern Store while in a flying community. Two young girls approached us and asked if we were teachers in the community. We told them no. They then told us that they assumed we were because we were looking at the teacher food. A powerful moment, as we know that teachers in the community are one of the groups that earn enough to purchase food at this price. Nutrition North is a federal program subsidizing retailers in remote northern communities. Its purpose is to make nutritious foods more affordable. While Nutrition North is meant to do good, food in those communities is still triple the cost that, some, that, that same food is in Timmins. Given the never-ending list of economic disparities that exist between First Nations and municipalities, do the candidates plan on making this, need, this basic need, that of food, more accessible through changes to the Nutrition North program? What would these changes look like? And we'll start with Ms. Michelle Bullock. A loaded question, thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, so I think the first flag in all of that was the, the, the idea that nutritious food was teacher foods. And so certainly one of the first changes would have to be an educational component, really ensuring that education and, and food and nutrition is, is integral and, and is a key component in, in the Nutrition North program. Um, of course, you know these, these kind of initiatives like the Northern Isolated Community Initiative Fund to help communities build the infrastructure that they need to be able to grow and, and, and eat the healthy food in their communities um, is important. We need to be uh, building more greenhouses, making sure that we have the spaces to preserve food uh, in those communities and create that food sustainability within the community. Um, so, of course, there, there would be some attention to be paid to the Nutrition North program. I think that it's a subsidy-based program, and we should be incentivizing the consumers to make the right choices rather than leaving that up to uh, our big corporations. And so uh, subsidies for the consumers would also be... Uh, at the heart of that. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Kramer? Uh, thank you. You know, the Northern Store definitely hits home in the last two weeks. I spent five days, four nights uh, in the James Bay Coast communities, so I understand what it was like to shop in a, in a Northern Store and, un and understand the prices that, uh, that they do, do face, uh, you know, acknowledging that that is, that is definitely one of the biggest issues up there to say, you know, it's teacher food is, is exactly what uh, my, my colleague said, is that it's the education part that I spoke about in my opening statement that, you know, at a young age, we need to understand that, you know, food is definitely a priority. It, it helps fuel us, helps move us. And that, that was very comforting to understand with the grade five, six class in Moosonee Public that you know, they're thinking about it at 10 years old. They understand that that's an issue moving forward and they want, they want to find a solution to that issue. So it's very you know, nice to see that they're thinking about that at a young age and understanding that it is an issue. When, you know, we look at building access to that food, I think that's definitely it, is how, we, how can we facilitate and provide access to making sure that there is healthy food at a reasonable price in our remote communities is something that we need to definitely look forward to. Thank you very much. Mr. Kennedy. As I mentioned in my previous answer, uh, one of the things that we're looking at doing is local growing programs such as containerized food growing systems that are coming to be fairly normal here in the south but can be readily transferred up to remote northern communities. It's really imperative for food security that we're actually consulting the people that are in the community, looking at what their needs are, what their abilities are, giving them the education so that they can access and maintain these kind of things. How often have we heard in third world countries where you go in, you put something in place and a few years down the line, it's gone because they don't know how to keep it. So education is a huge part of that. Um, that's, 
and support, of course, in the meantime, supporting the uh, financial supports that are in place right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Roy. Canada right now sends approximately $5 billion overseas to build infrastructures in Africa and Asia. Now, we propose that we take this money, repa repatriate it here to Canada. Why don't we build infrastructures up to those northern communities? That would definitely lower the prices because right now food is flown in. We could build those infrastructures. Five, billions a year, five billion a year, we probably build some pretty nice road up to those communities. Also, we want to tackle what are causing these inflated prices like the supply management. Right now, families are, uh, small families are spending somewhere like $300 to $400 extra per year because of inflated prices on, food, on such food as eggs, dairy products, and poultry. So by eliminating that controlled supply management by the government, we will lower prices for people like that to be affordable. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Angus. I believe the question was not about our local dairy farmers. I believe it was about Nutrition North. And Nutrition North is a failure. And the Harper government said that they would overhaul it, and they gave the subsidy to the Northwest Company, one of the richest companies in Canada with a very wealthy CEO. The Trudeau government said they would fix it, and everything stayed in place. The Nutrition North program has failed on so many levels. They were not accepting flour uh, as something to be considered subsidized for the longest time. We've had to fight on so many issues. We need to overhaul the program to give people choice so we can actually get healthy food into the community, not just the stuff you buy at the Northern store, which never seems to be discounted. And out of that, we have to start talking about the opportunities that we have in our region to work with the James Bay Coast on a shared food economy that we could be done through investing in cooperatives so that we're actually working together between our food economy here and the James Bay region to make life more affordable. Thank you very much. All right, Corey. Go ahead. So uh, we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, we did ask you to provide some questions, and uh, you definitely delivered. So uh, I'd <laughs> like to invite Maggie Jositis up, who would like to ask a question. Good evening. Evening. Can you please discuss access to quality foods and concern around food deserts, both up the coast and in the downtown Toronto area? Mr. Granke, I believe yeah. you're the one. Okay. Can you repeat the question? Yes. yes. Can you please discuss access to quality foods and concern around food deserts, both up the coast and in the downtown Toronto area? Sure, I'll speak specifically to uh, up the coast. That, that is our region that I want to focus on this evening. Um, you know, access to, what was the food, sorry, what was the second word, your food? Food about desert. Food yeah. deserts. No, sorry, the first part. It was uh, about access to quality foods. Quality, okay, thank you. Just want to make sure they use the right word. You know, quality foods, and I think that's exactly what, you know, Michelle spoke to earlier, you know, talking about teacher foods and the quality foods that needs to be ensured that we're eating. Uh, it comes back to education to ensure that, you know, we want to uh, have our children understanding that we need to have quality foods in our life to ensure the fuel that we need uh, moving forward. So, you know, the, when we're talking about access to quality foods, it's understanding what those quality foods is at that point to ensure that, you know, what they understand what a quality food is, that it's not just based on, you know, something they see or whatnot. They actually have a full understanding of the quality foods that they need to succeed in life. Mr. Kenny? The word quality food brings to mind what I think of as real food. A lot of the food that we eat is not food. It's food-like substances. I'm a member of Green Temiskaming, and one of the things that we're looking at doing right now is developing the old Charlton School into a community center where people can go to do canning, learn how to prepare their own food, educate themselves on how to actually prepare quality food. 
those that kind of an effort would be universally um, accessible, and and I should say should be university universally accessible. Food deserts are created because we expect factory production to be distributed to all, and it isn't. We need to actually grow the foods and process them in our communities, and that's something that the Green Party fully supports. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Roy. I think, again, I just, uh, by, for me, I, I'm kind of pushy on that idea of building uh, a road, uh, all-season road to those northern communities, because, again, that will provide better prices and more competition and access. But I believe that, and I think several people, several of our, my fellow candidates are, would agree with this, too, that we need to grow things local. And this is where I would send one of my special task force people, whether it's agriculture people, people that can uh, teach and train how to raise the different crops of different things. We can have build, uh, uh, build some greenhouses, even in those northern communities, here in our communities. And I believe that you, because the fresher they are, the better it is, and that's quality uh, that you, we want to have as for our consumers. Thank you very much. Mr. Angus. Thank you. Well, I think the issue of access to, to quality food is not just in the far north. We see Tomogamy, their grocery store runs two months of the year. Earlton lost their store. Smaller communities lose their stores, then lose access for seniors and poor people to, to, to food. And we end up with food deserts, and you even see them in cities. I saw them in Saskatoon and Winnipeg, where the big grocery stores were pulling out of the downtown. So what is the solution? Cooperatives are definitely a model, uh, but you know the margins in the food economy are so low that you really need economies of scale. But markets play a huge role, and I want to congratulate the Timmins Downtown Business Association with the farmers market and their work with the, the, the dollars to, to food opportunities so that people are actually getting local. So this is where we put investments in through FedNOR to say how do we get local food economy so that people are not being denied access to quality foods. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I concur that uh, the idea of food deserts isn't uh, strictly reserved to remote communities or to large, large urban areas. Um, I, I would see that here in Timmins. My little sister actually um, was living on a low income with a young, a young family, a young daughter, and she was living in Schumacher. And I would have considered that a food desert because mm-hmm. you would walk into her place and there would be boxes and boxes uh, of empty, empty pizza boxes, right? Because with a young daughter and no vehicle and no public transit getting, get going through, uh, she had no way to get to a healthy food store. And so things like the local food infrastructure fund that we saw in the last four years with an investment of $50 million to help support local food initiatives like, and I thought, they thought this idea was great, you know, healthy corner stores, healthy convenience stores, and, uh, and support farmer market and support food banks to make healthy food more accessible um, for everyone in those food deserts, in those remote communities. So there, there are some great solutions that we can bring forward. It's a matter of investment. It's a matter of, of initiative. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Corey, do you want me to ask one? Yeah, or? please. All right. Thank you. Uh, so far, I'm, I think I'm going to jinx it, but thanks for keeping to uh, the time frame. I'm afraid I might have just jinxed it, but We're thank you. We're very much frightened by her. She yeah. puts on this death glare. <laughs> we, came, we came from a debate that had a bell, so we're pretty yeah. struck. <laughs> All right. Given the link between poverty and food insecurity, what is your party's perspective to approach to poverty production, sorry, poverty reduction, including tax reform and a guaranteed annual income? Mr. Kennedy. Well, I mentioned that last one at least three times, I think. Um, And the way to pay for it, of course, is to look to the our wealthy. Um, right now, 70% of the production and of wealth in Canada goes to the top 20% of people who pay 25% of the taxes. So there's a lot of funding out there to, to be able to ask them to do it fairly. Um, I've talked about increasing uh, CPP for the elderly uh, to 50% of income replacement which will also go a long way towards uh, dealing with poverty issues. We've also talked about investing over $720 million in electric transportation hubs that will provide 
accessible and inexpensive transportation for people locally and for a long distance if that's necessary as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Roy. Concerning the tax, we as a party, we want to uh, reform the tax code and uh, we want to basically uh, increase the personal exemption from the tw 12, I think it's 12,000 uh, right now. We want to increase that to 15,000. So basically you have a lot of people here who would fall and not have to pay any tax whatsoever. And then over, over that, over $15,000, uh, people would uh, pay only 15% of income tax. But uh, I also I believe that one thing we can do is also eliminate trade barriers between provinces. Did you know that right now it is easier to import food from certain other countries than from other provinces? Because there are special interest groups that try to protect their own markets in their, pro in their provinces. But as a federal government, we have the jurisdiction and the powers through the Constitution to impose that, to free up the trades between, because agricultural products, for example, are again at inflated prices. Thank you very much. Mr. Angus. All around the world, we're seeing growing social instability because of the gap between the super rich and everyone else. The rise of the billionaire class is undermining the social orders in Europe. We see Trumpism in the United States. So the Democrats, we're not shy, we will tax. And we're going to be reasonable about it. If you make over $25 million, any hands there? We're going to tax you one more percent. That, according to the parliamentary budget officer, will bring in between 10 and $70 billion. That is how much money they're making. So we're not going to give any more gifts to Galen Weston to fix his fridges. We are going to make the choices that these money will be invested in our communities to make our communities more sustainable. We have, politics is about making choices. We can promise the moon, but we're gonna to need to know where we're gonna pay it. We'll take that and we'll start to establish a national housing program, free dental care, getting rid of the interest on student loans so that we can make life more affordable so people can make better choices. Thank you very much. Mrs. Wallow. Thank you. Again, this is something that we hold very dearly. In the past four years, the Liberal government has helped 900 million Canadians join the middle class. And we want to keep increasing that number. We want to bring that up until the, everyone is part of the middle class or higher. And so how are we going to do that? By cutting taxes for the lower, low income earners as well, again. So uh, we're going to cut taxes uh, on everyone's first $15,000. Um, and so those will be tax free. For some people in this room, $15,000 is your annual income and so you would go tax-free. Um, and we also know that a lot of students coming out of their graduate, uh, graduating with the college diplomas and universities are finding themselves living in poverty and struggling paycheck to paycheck. And so we want to make sure that you're in a position to pay back your student loan. And so we'll suspend repayments until you're earning $35,000 or more. And if you're starting a family, we'll suspend your payments for five years interest-free interest -free, so you could get your family on track, you could get on track before you have to start paying that back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Granke. Can I just ask to re repeat the question one more time? It's been quite... Oh, it was my question, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, it was your question. <laughs> just to make sure. Given the link between poverty and food insecurity, yep. what is your party's perspective and approach to poverty reduction, including tax reform and a guaranteed annual income? Okay, thank you very much for the question. You know, this, is, this hits, hits home definitely in the conservative platform at this point. You know, we want everybody to get ahead. We have a leader, leader much like myself, you know, grew up in a middle-class family that understood that putting food on the table was the priority, but, you know, what, there were struggles at times. We want to ensure that, you know, through tax credits and, and other activities that, you know what, we can make sure that you have more money at the end of the day in your pocket to, re, you know, reinvest in your family. That's, that's ultimately our goal. We've seen pr prices rise uh, through taxes that were implemented overnight, such as the carbon tax. Yes, we have a climate issue that we need to deal with, but putting you know, in taxes on you overnight isn't going to stop us from driving. It's going to increase our transportation costs, and it's ultimately going to increase the cost of food in our households. So understanding things like that and, and knowing that we need to keep our money here at home, reinvest it in ourselves, so that you know, we can get ahead together. I understand the burden of paying student debt and understand that part of it, but we need to ensure that we have as much money as possible at the end of the month at, uh, in back in your pocket. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McGee. 
All right, so this question here comes from Joanne, who's uh, sitting in the audience here tonight. She's indicated that post-secondary students are more housing precarious and food insecure than ever. Does your party have any specific plans to alleviate this problem? And I believe we are starting with Mr. Roy. Yes, yeah, sorry, Mr. Roy. I think we need, uh, concerning, the, I think so that's a two-facet question, so that for the housing, for example, there's a housing crisis in many places in Canada. One of the things that, of course, what causes that is because there's more demand than there is supply. So what is causing, what is, is causing the demand? Well, we need to have a serious look at immigration also right now because we have increased immigration to, to, to certain numbers that we did not have, we were not simply ready to receive. And it is causing, and, and for, as a matter of fact, as well, 40% of, of people coming to Canada, newcomers to Canada are going to live in cities like Toronto and Vancouver. So you wonder why the prices go up, because we just simply do not have the offer to meet the demand. So we need to take everything into, uh, into consideration and putting our Canadian citizens and Canadian uh, students first when we, uh, we, we consider these, uh, these problems. Thank you very much. Mr. Angus? Well, I'll disagree. I think immigration built our country. I think immigration continues to build our country. And I welcome immigration to our country. The question is about post-secondary education and precarious lives of uh, post-secondary students. And when we use the word precarious, we talk about precarious work, where students are coming out with forty dollars to $100,000 worth of debt, and it's a so-called gig economy. Uh, you know, no benefits, short-term contracts. Bill Morneau says, hey, that's the new normal. It's not the new normal. We have to start taking on these liberal conservative policies that are stripping students and workers of their rights. When I was young, you paid your university education with a summer job. So tinkering with how much debt you have to pay is not good enough because you can't afford proper housing, you can't afford proper food. I have daughters who are going through the system. They tell me what it's like. So we have to deal with the high and outrageous costs that have been downloaded to students for post-secondary education. We have to establish federal standards for federal workplaces and provincial workplace rights on the workers so that they're not in this perpetual cycle of the gig economy. Thank you very much. Mr. Angus? Mr. Boyle? Or Madam Boyle? Sorry. Thank you. So this is something that I could fully appreciate. Having worked in post-secondary education, it's something that I saw every day. My desk it just so happened to be next to the student counselors. And so I was privy to discussions around you know, students who chose to come to college because they wanted to better their lives, to get a good job, to be able to provide for their families. And now that they're in their studies, they're having a hard time getting by and they're thinking, contemplating dropping out just so that they can make it at the end of the month. And so, I mean, I, I, I drove the creation of the uh, food bank at the, at the college, a student food bank, because this was such a need. Uh, it's a, it is a serious issue and it's something that continues. It follows you to college and university. And so that's why the Liberals are, are, are proposing increasing the federal student grant by $12,000 a year. And so, again, putting more money in students' pockets so that they can make healthier lifestyle choices. And then once you're out of school, making sure that you're in a position to be able to afford paying back those student loans before we start asking for it so that you can, can get set up. We're making it easier for first-time home buyers, so that way students can, can feel secure in repaying their debts. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Mr. Granke. Uh, you know, much like Michelle, I can speak to this. I, you know, every month I do, I do pay a student loan to the National Student Loan Center in Canada, so I do understand that burden of you know, part of my paycheck every month that you know, goes to paying and ensuring that that, lo that loan is paid. Um, this is a prime example that we need to ensure that we have high quality jobs in our community, whether they're during uh, school time or during or after when a, a student has finished school and returns to the north. And that's another thing that we need, we need to have those uh, ensuring possibilities that people want to come back to the north as well to ensure that they have, uh, you know, jobs to come back to. When we speak to you no know, no interest before $35,000, the $35,000 mark is just above the minimum wage that is set right now. So understanding that you know what, most people don't fit into the category that the interest-free isn't available. So you know, ensuring that there's as much money as possible back in your pocket at the end of the month to ensure that your loans are paid, that you can continue to get, to get ahead. Thank you very much. Mr. Kennedy. I hate to sound like a broken record, but guaranteed livable income. If everybody can afford to live, 
it's not that big a problem. We're looking at also $10 billion into supports for post-secondary education. That will increase the opportunity for our young people to become uh, skilled in trades and all the types of jobs that right now are going begging, but pay a good dollar. Uh, forgive the student uh, debt for the uh, federal portion of it. If you don't have to pay it back, you're not in debt in the first place. Um, establishing a federal minimum wage of $15. Now, I know that we can't tell the provinces to do the same thing, but if it's done federally, they'll feel the pressure to do it for everybody. And, of course, those job creation uh, programs that we're talking about, whereby we're looking at fixing houses, et cetera, are high-quality jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Corey, if you have a question from the audience. Well, unfortunately, we are uh, at the point where we'll be asking one final question for the evening. <laughs> this has passed so quickly. What a good discussion. So this, this question here is from uh, our previously prepared questions. Right now, there are barriers for First Nations to have access to tradi traditional foods in hospitals, long-term care facilities, prisons, and public gatherings. What will be done at the federal level to remove barriers in order to increase access to foods that are cultural, or that are a cultural foundation, medicine, and identity? And I believe uh, Mr. Angus starts this one. Well, that's a very powerful question because it's also very difficult in the communities to gather traditional foods now uh, because of costs. And when you talk up in people in Cache and Attawapiskat, they talk about the difficulties. These foods are so much healthier. Uh, you know, people don't eat eggplant. What they're getting off the various uh, plants and, uh, and off the land provides so much more nutrition. And not having access to that has a huge social and uh, economic, it has an impact in terms of their health. So we would certainly work towards making that more accessible. But I would also suggest that one of the other ways of looking at this is to start the teachings. Uh, I look at Wild Basket that's in the Temiskaming region that are out in the land teaching people where the, the healthy country foods are. Because uh, a lot of people have lost those skills, so we can actually start to offer it closer to home. So it's not just James Bay, if someone's in the hospital in Timmins, but that education component on what healthy country food is and what it is on the land is so important, and we should be looking Rather at that as a model. Rather cut you off, Ms. Rangus, sorry. I got I'm to cut so somebody off. I'm excited. This. First time cut off tonight. <laughs> uh, Michelle. It's always the first time. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I fully agree that uh, we do need to be um, uh, assigning a greater value to culturally appropriate foods. And so I think that a uh, first place to start would by building in policy framework to, to make sure that, um, that we're, we're going to culturally um, uh, acceptable food or culturally appropriate food first, that that's where we're looking first. Um, you know, I, I remember I was at the, uh, the, the Orange T-shirt Day um, walk and uh, there was a young indigenous girl who had said that she had never tasted bannock before. And though I know that it's not country foods, uh, certainly, and that these are imported ingredients, that these are, you know, um, it was this idea that uh, there was, uh, you know, a, a certain lack of, of cultural um, 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 identity and cultural attachment to it that, uh, that I found rather concerning. And so I think that uh, especially as we're developing these national food, uh, national f school food programs that within it, there is policy framework that says, let's go to culturally appropriate foods first. Thank you very much. Mr. Grenke. Thank you. You know, I definitely want to acknowledge there are red tape issues with, uh, with this type of endeavor, and much is the same as, you know, even as simple as bringing a donation of food uh, into somewhere after it's been prepared uh, somewhere to address that. You know, there are those issues that we want to help as much as we can, but ultimately sometimes we can't. Uh, talking much as, as what our colleagues up here have mentioned is costs to ensure that you know, we have the ability to, to get the traditional uh, food and, and uh, activities done in those regions. Uh, but you know, ultimately, ultimately supporting uh, groups such as, you know, I've had great conversations with uh, the folks at Missaway to understand you know, the supports through food and medicine and the teachings that they provide there 
can bring, bring somebody back on track just, just by those simple conversations to be had and, and to sit down and understand those conversations. But it comes back to what we've talked about all night is education. And in this case, you know, working with elders to understand uh, to the benefits and, what on the, and the teachings behind it. So ultimately, we have to teach the education piece to have an understanding of what uh, we should be looking for moving forward. Thank you very much. Mr. Kennedy. I'm going to take a slightly different tact. Um, I don't think the availability of these foods is, is the pro- biggest part of the problem, but access to those foods. And I think the biggest barrier to uh, accessing culturally appropriate foods is we simply do not respect indigenous sovereignty and the right to self-determination. We have all these treaties with them that say that they are their own nation, and yet we impose settler culture on them. This has to end. What I would be working towards is ending that dichotomy. We need to recognize the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and work with them so that those foods and medicines can be readily accessed whenever they want, not denied them by our culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Roy. I just want to say that since uh, Mr. Angus insinuated that I am against immigrants, I would just like to let him know that my wife is an immigrant and she received her Canadian citizenship uh, this past January. Um, I believe, again, here that to help whether it's First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and actually there's so many, Canada is made up of, uh, of so many different cultural backgrounds and ethnicities and nations. I believe that, again, the best way to approach that is having their own people who are knowledgeable in, in their different foods to form those charitable non-governmental organizations where we as, as government can come alongside and help them, facilitate, be, do whatever, offer our expertise, not the governments, but those who are experts that, that can help and, and, and to provide these different uh, things to the, not just the First Nations, but every uh, people group in Canada. Thank you very much. Uh, Corey, do you have anything else there or do you want to get on? Do we have to get on to the... I think we're moving on. To moving on. So uh, first I want to say thank you for all the great questions from the audience. Uh, I know Corey has a pile of questions there and I, I actually would have loved to hear what the rest of them were. Uh, unfortunately, there is a time constraint, so I, I apologize for that. Uh, so we will move on to the closing remarks. Uh, we will now, uh, so we will be giving two minutes for closing remarks for everyone. I will be keeping at a hard two minutes. The moment that the uh, red uh, stop sign does go up, I will be uh, cutting you off. Uh, so it will be a hard, hard two minutes. And uh, this time we're going to go in the opposite direction. We're going to start with Mr. Roy, and we will move our way down the table. So uh, the floor is yours. Two minutes, closing remarks. Thank you. I believe that real leaders lead by example and not by imposing their views or their beliefs on others. I have shared how authentic charity is expressed by our free will. When I took the decision to leave my country in the pursuit of charitable causes, I made decisions that required self-denial about my own materialistic ambitions. I gladly accepted to live a minimalistic lifestyle to better allocate finances, financial resources to a more noble cause. I believe in individual freedom and personal responsibility. I also believe that communities need to look out for each other and help one another. I am presently living on a $55,000 a year salary. My wife and I do not live above our means and we are very content with what we have. We live in a small 332 square feet apartment within a house that we own. If you elect me as your MP, my new basic salary will be approximately $175,000. My wife and I do not need much to live on, and we have no intention of raising up our standard of living. We will continue to uphold our values and priorities to allocate our, fi- our resources in the pursuit of charity. Therefore, I make this solemn pledge right now that if I am elected, I will lead by example in this and donate half of my net salary as an MP to the work of, to advance the work of charitable non-governmental organizations throughout this district. I have already started to scout for trustworthy NGOs which I would support. Someone recommended that I should not share this and that it may be misunderstood or misrepresented. 
Honestly, I don't care how people interpret this decision because this is who I am and this is the way that I have been living for the last 25 years. My wife and I have now turned our attention to the people at this writing and we will serve them with the same devotion as we have served in foreign countries. From this Lord's Kitchen, I wish you his blessings on each and every one of you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. Or, oh my God. I guess well, I'll give time to clap. I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy. Thank you. Um, I think we've pretty much covered food insecurity for the night. So I'm going to just give a few uh, remarks to close it. Everything you've heard here tonight is meaningless if you have a government in place that will not keep its word. It's that simple. I'm sure everyone here will agree with me. We've, that's what we've seen over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Governments promise you the world, and then they do not do what they say that they're going to do. You need a fair, honest government. Integrity is what I stand for. We have to be in this together, or we will surely fail again. So I'm asking you, send a green to Parliament to keep everybody honest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Granke. Uh, thank you. I want to thank the Anti-Hunger Coalition and the Lord's Kitchen for having us here this evening. We knew coming in that this issue was not going to be as resolved at this gathering, but my government's priority uh, is to take care of our own. Uh, us as Canadians, we have our issues here. We've acknowledged that, that we need to take care of our own here in Canada to ensure that our viability moving forward is, is addressed and adhered to. As the incoming elected representative for Tim's James Bay, you won't see me swoop in on October 22nd and you know, resolve this issue in one day. Those of you here tonight are the ones that who are going to continue, sorry, to carry this torch for the food insecurity. You have my 100% commitment to continuing this discussion with you, and where I can be an advocate as your MP, you will have my support 100%. It amazes me the work of the Anti-Hunger Coalition, Living Space, and Lord's Kitchen as they continue day in and day out to provide services in our community to ensure that everyone has a hot meal. I've said this many times, this isn't a question of what you are going to do, it's a question of what we are going to do together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kren uh, Granke. I'm mixing names up now, apologize. Oh, Madame Boileau. Merci. Firstly, I'd like to thank the facilitators for this Eat, Think, Vote event uh, this evening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to engage with everyone on these very important issues that are sadly still too close to home. I've been to four debates now, and every time we have the chance to close our statements with some comments, and there's never enough time to cover all of the issues that we know matter here in Timmins James Bay. I've been knocking on doors across the region, and I've been hearing a common theme. It's that we can't afford to go back. We can't afford to lose more jobs or to let our infrastructure fall into disrepair. We can't afford to watch our youth leave for better opportunities in the South, and we can't afford to have to choose between putting a roof over our head or food on our table. We know too well what austerity feels like here in Ontario. And that's why we need a seat at the federal table that can deliver practical, everyday solutions that move us forward now. The Conservatives in the last mandate voted against giving money to your family with the Canada Child Benefit. They voted against cutting your taxes, they voted against a stronger Canada pension plan, and they failed to acknowledge the urgency of the climate crisis that we're finding ourselves in today. As your Member of Parliament, I would be continuing the work that I'm already doing with our communities. The work that I do on the board of directors for the Cochrane District Social Planning Council and the CDSAB, the kind of work that makes it easier for our uh, residents to make ends meet at the end of the month. As, uh, in addition, I'll be joining a strong, hard-working group of Liberal MPs from Northern Ontario. We would be speaking for the North in one united voice to ensure that we get our fair share here. So on October 21st, we have an opportunity. We have the opportunity to keep moving forward together or risk being left behind. And so I want to move forward with you, and to do that, I need your support. I'm Michel Boileau, and I'm asking for your vote. Miigwech. Thank you, Michelle. Mr. Angus? Well, thank you. Uh, this has been a really profound discussion. Because if you talk, you know, what they watch the national media, they're this kind of like, oh, nothing's happening in this election. 
you know, he said, he said, he said, she said. But profound issues are being discussed. And profound issues confront us. Like I said, when people are stopping bridges in the major cities because this young generation believes that their parents' generation, that the business class and political leaders are condemning them to a precarious future, we have to say, no, we can do better. When we have 2,000 homeless people in the city of Timmins, a number that would have been unimaginable 10 years ago, we have to say that no matter how hard the Lord's Kitchen works or the Love Project works, it is not enough because the federal government hasn't been at the table. And I'm sorry, Justin Trudeau made so many beautiful promises and continues to make beautiful promises, but they're putting less into housing than Stephen Harper did. They're taking the Human Rights Tribunal to court and demanding that Cindy Blackstock pay the government's share as Indigenous children are dying on our watch. This next parliament, my friends, we're going to be confronted with profound questions for the coming generation. And it will most likely be a minority. What you want in Ottawa is someone with the experience who knows how to get things done. It was considered normal here that we had some of the highest suicide rates in the world. Normal, but sad. And we began to work with grassroots organizations to establish a national suicide action plan. Just like we put the issue of the underfunding of education on the agenda once and for all. With this young generation, with the issues facing us with climate and housing and growing insecurity, you need someone that you know has your back. I've been honored to do this work. I've been honored to get my politics in church basements like this. Thank you, merci miigwech. So, thank you all for actively engaging in the Eat, Think, Vote event. We encourage you to keep updated with how the different political candidates in the federal election are addressing the food issues discussed today. To stay updated with the work of Food Secure Canada and its members, we invite you to sign up for Food Secure Canada updates on their website and staying in touch. So if you're interested in learning more about the Anti-Hunger Coalition and their activities here in Timmins, uh, or volunteering with the organization, or if you have any questions, uh, please ensure that you leave your name on the sign-up sheet uh, located at the ACT info table uh, before leaving. So Jen can probably show us uh, the general direction. <laughs> Anyways, I'd like to thank you so much for having us here tonight, and uh, thank you so much to our candidates for participating. Uh, really thoughtful discussion, so thank you so much.